you know, Taylor Swift benefited from an informational cascade. She's also really good, but there are a lot of good people who didn't benefit from an informational cascade. Probably they're not quite as good as Taylor Swift, but they're really good and you've never heard of them. Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Drayton Discourse, brought to you by the Economist Society at UCL. My name is Vanderika. And I'm Yash. And we are thrilled today to be joined by American legal scholar and co-author of Nudge, Professor Cass Sunstein. Professor Sunstein's most prominent research revolves around Nudge theory and understanding how public and private organizations can help people make better decisions in their daily lives. He looked into what empirical evidence reveals about human behavior and founded the theory of libertarian paternalism, which he explores with Richard Taylor in his book, Nudge. Professor Sunstein has also studied how information is dissipated in social networks, a topic he will address today. He specializes in constitutional, administrative, and environmental law, and has served as the administrator of White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs in the Obama administration from 2009 to 2012. So without further ado, let's straight get to the interview. Okay, so Professor, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the interview of the Drayton Discourse. So uh, for the first question, you know, you see most of the world is currently under lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we've seen a massive shift in human behavior, you know, when it comes to travel restrictions and uh, wearing masks and even like deeper changes in the sort of environment. People are interacting with work from home and uh, staying with families for longer periods of time. So uh, as a behavioral economist, uh, what are some of the things that fascinate you when you look at, you know, the current scenario of the world? Okay, so I should say uh, that I'm trained as a lawyer and I've learned as much as I can about behavioral economics, but I, I wish I were actually an economist. I'm more an uh, admirer and a co-author. Uh, but in terms of behavioral economics and the current situation, uh, the most fascinating thing is the sheer speed of the change. So the fact that people all over the world are wearing masks who would have thought in recent times that that was not possible and that would be really irritating. The number of people who have adjusted to working from home who would have thought, no, I'm not going to work at home. That's inconvenient and there are children and dogs and spouses around. So the adaptability of uh, our species to radically different circumstances and what's made the change so possible in that quick time? That's a really fascinating question. Uh, behavioral science, including uh, cognitive psychology and social psychology and behavioral economics, uh, those three fields give us some clues about how this happened. Uh, but to have either uh, a thick description of, of how this happened or to have uh, uh, a very rigorous account those are two different things, uh, would be a great advance. And then we'd know something from which we could make predictions for the future. Thank you for answering. It's true, these changes have are really unprecedented. Um, and in your opinion, what changes do you think we'll see in the long term as a result of the pandemic? Well, uh, if there's a Latin word for habit, um, we might say homo sapiens is actually homo habitus, meaning that once habits develop, they can be really robust. So one thing I expect we'll see is that online business and online meetings will have a kind of um, uh, attraction that they had lacked heretofore. We'll also see, I think it's pretty clear, uh, much more telework, uh, and telecommuting uh, and correspondingly less travel, though some people will almost be jumping for joy once they learn they can actually get on an airplane and get somewhere. But many others will be thinking, well, you know, I can do it pretty much as well from my office or home. So we'll see, I think, a fair bit of that. Uh, we'll also see, I think, an enduring really good thing 
which is that private and public institutions are both reducing sludge, understood as administrative burdens or paperwork requirements or reporting requirements. And there's been a war on sludge in many nations, particularly aimed at helping people who are sick or who are poor or who are elderly. And that is uh, in all likelihood going to endure. And I, I hope that war is um, accelerated because it promises to save people time. And it also promises to give people access to things like licenses and permits uh, that can make, make their lives much better. That's great. And I think okay. even the US unemployment system, like now you talk about changing habits and you know reducing sludge. I think that was a system that came under heavy scrutiny and a revamping when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. And yes. Uh, Yes. So I, I worked in the White House for about four years and uh, I came late to sludge reduction as a priority and we did some things, but not nearly enough. And one uh, problem that I think governments all over the world face is that they have so many priorities and so many um, challenges that to get something to the top of the queue is hard. With the pandemic, sludge reduction has gotten to the top of the queue, and that uh, is going to pay big dividends in the long run for for the many of the most disadvantaged members of society. Yeah, and uh, speaking about what uh, governments are doing, you know, you wrote, wrote about uh, you know how uh, like libertarian paternalism, essentially, and how uh, changes can be driven by governments. So could you elaborate upon, um, you know, what exactly libertarian paternalism is uh, for, the, for our audience? So the basic idea is that often it's possible for government or for your employer uh, to preserve your freedom of choice, so it's libertarian, but also to be paternalistic in the sense of steering you. So if you see a... Uh, set of signs at what we used to go to airports. They are telling you how to get various places and there's a paternalistic dimension. They are steering you. Uh, a GPS is paternalistic and it's libertarian. You can say, I don't like that route or I wanna go someplace that's pretty, not that's fast, uh, but it is um, uh, steering you. So think of warnings and reminders and uh, uh, references to the social norm as uh, libertarian paternalism. Or think of something that automatically enrolls you now into a pension plan or into a healthcare plan or to double-sided printing. That's libertarian paternalism. It allows you to change and go where you want to go or do what you want to do, but there's a, a presumption in it by the choice architect who's the designer of the uh, system uh, of, of, of what's best for you. And whether we want libertarian paternalism or not, we're gonna have a ton of it because if there's a office or a website or a street, uh, it's going to have some steering in it, it can't be avoided. Uh, the beauty of libertarian paternalism, I think, is that if we have a good choice architect, and that's a very important if, we can preserve freedom of choice and thus respect um, you know, what might be at the heart of economic theories, neoclassical theories, which is freedom of choice. You know, People are sovereign, while also uh, helping people to live better and longer lives. And uh, like you said, that it's about you know, sort of like this, uh, nudging people towards the right direction, allow helping them to build, develop uh, positive habits. But in the current scenario, scenario we see that uh, a lot of governments are mandating people. To, you know, for example, stay at home, wear masks, etc. Yes. So regarding that, in the context of the pandemic, where do you think libertarian paternalism has played a role or still can play a role, you know, in incentivizing people for the benefit of society? It's a great question. So let's think of nudges, meaning uh, interventions that preserve people's freedom of choice but steer people as either complements to mandates and bans or as uh, substitutes, alternatives. So in many places where there are stay-at-home orders or there are ideas about um, 
Uh, you have to wear a mask. In many places that do that, there's also nudging going on to make the mandate effective. And in many other places, there are, you know, uh, uh, encouragements to do certain things that aren't strictly speaking mandates. So for uh, Harvard right now, my institution uh, has nudged us strongly to do no domestic travel. The, the, it hasn't forbidden it, it lacks the authority to do that. They, they could speak in somewhat stronger terms. They could threaten to cut our salaries or fire us or something. They don't, they, they nudge us. So uh, private institutions that are opening up a little bit, like saying you can go into the office, there are some places where you can, but you are nudged either by reference to your own welfare, saying, you know, there's a risk you'll incur if you go, or by reference to things you might do to other people, where if you go, you might get other people sick. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, additions, let's say, to the mandates that are libertarian paternalism. And in places that have been, you know, not as aggressive as other places in, uh, with mandates and bans, we're seeing a lot of uh, nudging. Yes, that, that is very interesting. And well, speaking of how governments have been advising their populations on how to act, um, we have seen that there's been a lot of backlash against some measures that heads of state have been advocating. For example, if we think of President Trump, who has been advising to inject ourselves with disinfectants. And also, it seems like we have we see new miracle cures that are discovered every day and showcased in the media. In your opinion, um, in a time like this, where social media and sensationalism dominate the platform, what are the possible ways we can approach this massive influx of information to avoid being misled? Hey, great. Uh, Facebook has a policy which prohibits falsehoods that create imminent risks to health. Uh, that's a good policy. So for private information providers uh, not to have stuff that is A, false, and B, creates an imminent risk is a really good idea. So we need a lot more, I think, uh, thinking and action by those who provide information that is attuned to the possibly fatal effects of lies and mistakes with respect to health. So that's a really high priority these days. For each of us who might not be, as I certainly am not, an expert on the science, the best thing you can do is to um, have clarity before you read anything and take it seriously about whether it deserves your trust. And the social science data shows that that's not actually natural for our species, that we're very good at responding to primary information, like someone says it's gonna be hot outside or um, you know, wear a mask or don't wear a mask. We're very good at responding to that. Not perfect, but good. What we're not good at, it's not part of our nature, is to think hard about whether the primary information is reliable. We tend, naturally and think, oh, I, I hear that, not, oh, the person who said that is, um, has a private agenda or doesn't know what he or she's talking about. So for us, it, it, certainly when the health stakes are high or when the economic stakes are high, to be thinking about the reliability of the source as well as the uh, you know, nature and intensity with which the information is provided is, is really good. Anyone who's been spammed probably knows, uh, or who's been tricked through spam, let's say, uh, is probably alert to this, where you're told something and it's either pleasing or scary, and your initial reaction is a smile or a, or a frown. Uh, and then it's only a subsequent mental operation that makes you think, I have no reason to believe that. Um, I'm working on a paper right now about things that uh, media providers can do to boost people's capacity to recognize falsehoods as such, or to create architecture that downgrades falsehoods so that people will see that they're not reliable or not see them much at all. 
So these are different strategies. The architecture, say, on the news, Facebook's news feed, where the thing is not highly visible because Facebook doesn't make it highly visible because it's false, or something that directs you, as Twitter is now doing, to an information source that's more reliable, to be very uh, attuned to the question of trustworthiness. Yeah, and you spoke about, you just now spoke about reliability, right? And I read with Daniel Kahneman's work also that a lot of the ways that we look at a source as reliable or not is its availability. And that's something you've looked at too, like uh, speaking of availability cascades. So now moving uh, the discussion to something a little broader and about the dissipation of information in general. Like for our audience, could you explain what uh, information and availability cascades are? Great. So one of the best ideas, I think, in economic theory in the last uh, quarter century, possibly the last half century, is the idea of the informational cascade by a team of authors. And the basic idea is assume, this is going to be very stylized and simple, assume there's a group of six people in a, in a queue. Uh, a temporal cue in which they're announcing their views. And the question is whether genetic modification of food is dangerous, let's say. Let's say the first one, Alan, says it's really dangerous. Don't eat genetically modified food. You'll get sick. Then let's suppose the second, Barbara, doesn't really know or she's an equipoise. Or maybe she slightly thinks genetically modified food isn't dangerous, but she trusts the first speaker. Then she says, you know what, I think so too, because she's influenced by the informational signal given by the first. Then we have two people who said genetically modified food is dangerous. Then there's a third, let's say Charles, who'd have to have a fair bit of information to reject their shared view, which seems to suggest if those people are trustworthy or friends, that this is something to avoid. And then let's say Dorothy, who's the fourth in the queue, is probably going to be in a cascade unless she has a lot of specialized knowledge. And the trick in the informational cascade work is it shows how doctors or lawyers, my clan, or uh, people in fashion or people in uh, Music, you know, Taylor Swift benefited from an informational cascade. She's also really good, but there are a lot of good people who didn't benefit from an informational cascade. Probably they're not quite as good as Taylor Swift, but they're really good and you've never heard of them. And so we can see um, initial uh, convictions expressed by relatively few people under the right conditions, uh, creating a cascade of belief that may be baseless and it may be that the information held by the group of believers is actually really thin so there are just a few early movers uh, so if we want to explain you know uh, uh, brexit or trump or obama or hashtag me too or uh, an, uh, galileo and why he ultimately succeeded he was also right uh, informational cascades provide a significant part of the picture okay the idea of availability cascades something i've worked on with a terrific economist named timur Curran, uh adds uh, the psychological point, which behavioral economists have done a lot of great work with, which is that when we can easily bring to mind an example, then our probability judgments inflate. So if the question is, is there going to be an accident, a crime in my neighborhood, or is it uh, dangerous to walk at night? Uh, if there's a cognitively available illustration, then our judgment of probability is inflated, and if there isn't, it's depressed. So we tend to be not intuitive statisticians, but we use the availability heuristic. Okay, if there's an available incident in which something great or terrible happened, then that can interact with the informational account I just gave, such that the story or incident proliferates through society and makes people really scared. This can happen at, you know, for good, as when 
you know, there really is a threat that people had ignored that an incident alerts them to, or not so good as when people hear of one off, let's say, uh, you know, tragic airline disaster, but then people start thinking air travel is unsafe. So with respect to hazardous waste dumps in the United States, which in my view is a relatively small, not zero, it's important, but compared to other problems, it's not at the top of the list. Environmental problem, there was uh, an incident that shot through our society, and that hence an availability cascade. It made people put that to, toward the top of the list of environmental problems. And priority setting, uh, certainly within the public, and if things aren't going really well, with the government can be um, greatly influenced by availability cascades. I saw that when I worked in our White House, when I was in charge of regulation in general, when sometimes there'd be uh, an impetus to do something pretty costly about a relatively small problem because there was one incident that had uh, activated people's sense that of, oh my God, so what we're talking about here, I think, is really interesting conceptually as well as practically important. Uh, the informational cascades literature is uh, uh, pure economics. It, it, it's full rationality, as I described it. The availability material is behavioral. And once the two are combined, maybe we can understand uh, a lot of stuff uh, with respect to factual judgments, uh, movements that uh, ca catch on fire and uh, excessive or unjustified fear. Yeah. And you mentioned how like these cascades have extremely practical purposes as well. So what role do you think they've played in promoting or in some cases, you know, hindering a response to the COVID-19 pandemic? And I mean this at an individual or state level. Like, Yes. So I think actually the uh, eventual in some countries, including my own, too slow response was productively spurred by availability and availability cascade. There was a time, this is a kind of um, a cousin of what I'm describing as you know, fortunate that people eventually responded very strongly. Uh, there was a time in the United States when people were really scared of getting Ebola uh, and it was causing a lot of uh, a fear and precautions, even though at that time, more Americans had married the average movie star than had died of Ebola, meaning two Americans, I think, this is not empirical, this is impressionistic, two Americans have married the average movie star. And at the relevant time, one American had died of Ebola. So the risk level was relatively low, but people were really, really scared. And that's because there was an example of, the, of a death that was all over the place. And that can, uh, you know, create uh, unjustified fear, though it can have a fortunate effect, and in this case it probably did, of activating government attention. Yes, and um, going on, on the same topic of the avail how availability cascades are applied, are there any ideas that countries can adopt which can help increase availability and urgency of other issues, for example, climate change? Yes, so uh, let's talk about at the government level and then let's talk about at the level of societies. So in my view, uh, the best available tool for understanding what to do about greenhouse gas emissions is cost-benefit analysis. And while it isn't standard for people to smile and jump up and down with enthusiasm when they hear the words cost-benefit analysis, even so, let us march. And uh, the, the basic idea is that, you know, if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, uh, that's going to have a cost. And then the question is, what's the benefit? Now to calculate that, we need to know the social cost of carbon, how much is the damage done by a ton of carbon emissions, and well, any number there is not going to kind of be very precise. There's terrific work done in New Haven, which helped get Nordhaus the Nobel Prize, uh, in London and in Germany that provide models for the social cost of carbon. And there's superb work being done to kind of improve those three leading models. Um, 
the U.S. government and Canada and several others have a social cost of carbon. Uh, uh, until relatively recently, it was about $40 per ton. And now we can just run numbers. And uh, under the Obama administration, where I was there, uh, we did a lot to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles, from power plants, basically from uh, the vast majority of the sources. It might, probably wasn't enough, but it was a start and it was determined by a cost benefit calculation. And then if people aren't scared, let's say about climate change, still you have an analytic tool to uh, uh, help orient what kind of actions you should take. There are um, climate denialists, let's say, and uh, uh, business first or business only types who are ignoring the benefits of greenhouse gas reductions and cost benefit analysis just demonstrates that that's a mistake. And then there are others, activists, who say we should do whatever is feasible. Well, it's feasible to say there can't be any motor vehicles anymore. But that would be very hard to defend on cost-benefit grounds. So, so long as we have an analytic tool and we do our best to figure out what the relevant numbers are, uh, we can, you know, we can we can do a lot, and we probably will do, you know, with a little luck, maybe a lot of luck, basically the right amount. So there are paths that economic analysis strongly suggests are the right paths, and my deep hope is that. Uh, governments all over the world will increasingly fasten on, on these tools. Um, in terms of societies generally and democratic will, which is of course you know, a major factor in determining what government does, it may be the major factor. Um, uh, the most interesting kind of behavioral economics finding is called solution aversion. And the idea is that if people think that the consequence of recognizing the magnitude of the climate change problem is that they're going to have to pay a really high gasoline tax, they are likely to think, I don't believe the science is there. We saw something in this ballpark in Paris, the response to the uh, the tax. If people, by contrast, are told that the response to the climate change problem is increased investments in um, a, a good energy future, that we're going to be promoting entrepreneurial activity and spurring economic growth, then they are much more likely to say, oh, climate change, that's real. Which shows that the belief or non belief in climate change among many people is uh, dependent on what they think the consequences of saying yes are. So I think it's up to people concerned about climate change um, uh, in good faith to say we are going to think of responses that can be in many ways helpful to other goals. And if they're not only helpful to other goals, uh, the pain isn't that severe. Well, we really hope your hopes will be fulfilled and people will follow your advice. <laughs> um, so at this point of the interview, um, I think our audience would be interested to know a little bit more about your other research. Um, for instance, your book, The World According to Star Wars, has seen tremendous success and it makes really fascinating comparisons between, well, the universe of Star Wars and our world. And so my first question is, um, what inspired you to compare these two worlds and how did you develop this idea? I am grateful for the kind remarks and also saying that this was other research. And it's actually accurate because I did obsessive research on Star Wars and managed not to get fired by my employer as a result. I tried while I was doing my Star Wars book to work on really technical articles so that I wouldn't lose all credibility. Uh, so what inspired me kind of locally was uh, I have a son who's now 11. He was younger than that then, uh, but still you know, not old enough to be able to watch Star Wars. And he really liked it. So his enthusiasm for Star Wars as a little boy 
uh, made me think, well, what is it about Star Wars that all these years after release, and we're talking about the, you know, the first released movies, not the uh, prequels. Uh, so these are really old movies, and he loved them. Uh, what, what's resonating? Why could they succeed so much? And uh, you know, how did George Lucas, the creator, get into people's heads? And I found that um, an irresistible question. And it's related to some of the things we're talking about, about cascade effects. And it also tests the question whether cultural success or idea success is a result of intrinsic merit, or is it has having to do with the zeitgeist of the time or something to do with culture. And so that, that really got me fascinated. And I think the combination of the, let's call it social science question, with the, uh, the Star Wars saga is really interesting, meaning the movies, and also the saga of the saga turns out to be fascinating, where you know, people had no faith in this movie early on. People saw it in the studio and thought this is going to be a disaster. Uh, George Lucas himself was fearful that it wouldn't be successful. And so the saga of the saga got me uh, intrigued in a, in, in a narrative. It's almost a, uh, a novel. The, but I tried to tell it of how Star Wars got made and the cast of characters is uh, really interesting. Well, as a fellow fan of Star Wars myself, I find this really incredible. <laughs> um, so speaking of movies, is there, in your opinion, a movie that every student should watch in their life and in which we could maybe draw other parallels like the ones you've made um, looking at Star Wars? Well, there's an old movie called Laura, which I saw recently, which is about perception and uh, attention and availability and motivated reasoning. It's, it's a really old movie. Um, it's really good about uh, uh, human nature. So it has uh, a lot to say implicitly about rationality and bounded rationality. It also has some interesting things to say about gender. So it's in, in, in many ways, ahead of its time. Well, that sounds really interesting. I'll be sure to put it down on my list. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we just heard you speak about climate change and, and we know about your involvement in environmental law, but it looks like you have also been active in another field um, while exploring the legal and political issues of animal rights. Could you tell us what has driven you to fight for animal rights? Okay, so uh, a friendly amendment. Uh, I don't like the idea of fighting. Uh, just it's, it's a character flaw probably of mine that uh, you know, most of what I do is either academic scribbling or working with governments. And if your convictions are strong, then I hope you argue for or explain or try to defend and to, to fight for. You know, I was a boxer as a kid and fighting you hurt people and you get hurt. So for animal rights, uh, but not in a punching anybody way. Uh, uh, okay, it's complicated, right? Because if pe people are being hurt, maybe, and dogs are being hurt, we probably should defend them, maybe in some sense fighting's justified. But to your question, uh, um, uh, I feel in my bones as well as in my brain, uh, the truth of Bentham's question, uh, which is about the question, which is not can they think, but can they suffer? So if you have a horse or a dog or a pig, and it's made to suffer, that's uh, a wrong. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm toying with the word cruelty. I wanna be careful with that because the state of mind of the person who, you know, let's say does something that leads to the suffering of cows or pigs, it isn't cruel. It's a person who's just living his or her life. But the experience for the creature is cruel. 
And so uh, to, to stop suffering, it's, it's almost, you know, we've talked about Star Wars, we can talk about Star Trek, where there's a prime directive, which is not to interfere with societies that are visited by the Federation. Forgive the reference. The prime directive for us, I think, as you know, people who are blessed to be alive is not to inflict suffering. And all over the world, that's being done by good people. And to reduce that would be a, a really great thing. So that, that's what got me interested. Yeah, thank you so much and sorry for characterizing your efforts as a fight and we completely understand what you mean by uh, what I, I don't mind, it's just a, it's, uh, I'm sure it's a character flaw that I don't think of those terms. Yeah, uh, so now moving, like you talked about your research and like your efforts in animal rights and Star Wars particularly. So now we could move on to the more personal aspect of the interview, what uh, our viewers would want to hear from you. So like speaking about quarantine, you know, like how have you been spending time during quarantine and is there anything new you have tried? Well, I've gotten to know my dogs really, really well. Speaking about animal uh, rights, they're not visiting us during the session, but and I knew them very well before, but now I know them very, very well. We're spending a lot of quality time together. Um, uh, I'm, I play racket sports, squash and tennis. And uh, uh, during this shutdown, most of it, until recently, I'm not able to play either. Uh, and so we set up a little, we have a backyard that has a tiny, tiny basketball court. And we set up a uh, tennis net in there. So I've played some tennis in the backyard. I've uh, spent a lot of time with my uh, children, uh, one of whom is 11, one of whom just turned eight. Uh, in terms of work day, I found that the ability without uh, the commute into the office and without any travel, the ability to focus on writing is, uh, is, is really there. So I've spent more time writing. I think probably that's not good news for anyone, but <laughs> it's, it's a fact, I've spent more time writing. And I've spent uh, considerable time working uh, with officials in various places on the pandemic and thinking about how behavioral economics might be able to be helpful. Well, it seems like you have been keeping yourself very occupied. <laughs> um, so I'm sure that among our audience, there are students who would also, who are also interested in pursuing a career in research. In research. Um, so is there any advice you would give yourself if you were to travel back in time? Um, if you had to tell something to your past self, what would it be? Well, I think I, I, I think I knew it, but uh, to find projects that you really enjoy working on is the best heuristic for whether it's going to go well. Uh, so if there's a writing project that's going to last, you know, a year or two years or even three months, if you're suffering during it, the chance that it's going to be good is reduced. Now, some people do produce with the kind of uh, you know, determination amidst suffering. But to think, I wouldn't use the word passion, which some people use. I, I use more, more like the word, if you feel something, I sometimes feel it almost on the back of the neck, which is almost like a tickle, where there's an idea or a, a, a question that it, it's just, it delights me. And if you feel that sense of delight or curiosity, more intense, I think, than curiosity, or if you think you have something that's like a tiger by the tail, that's a great feeling. It often is, you know, daunting because the thing's running away. So I'm, I'm working on something now, uh, which is about how to handle risks where you can't assign probabilities, sometimes described as nighty and uncertainty. It's a very controversial idea within economics. The great Frank Ramsey thought there was no such thing really as uncertainty. We always assign subjective probabilities to things. So this is a very contested question in economics. And the current view is, you know, there isn't such a thing as uncertainty. 
and where assignments are, aren't real, I, where, where assignment of probability is, is random, and we don't have any basis for assigning probability. A lot of economists think that's not a category. I think it is a category that uncertainty is real, and that gives me a kind of tickle in the neck. And to think how uh, regulators and policymakers should respond to the presence of uncertainty, and it's just an example of something that is, I feel like a tiger by the tail. And we all sometimes have that feeling. And uh, I think if, if you have that feeling, stay there. I'm pretty sure a lot of our viewers will use that advice pretty well and in their lives. And now, like our last question talked about time travel. So, you know, building on that point, and this is more of like a creative question for you, is that if you could, for example, travel back in time, you know, to any era and meet anyone, like where would you go and why? What a great question. Uh, I, I'll give the unimaginative answer, which is the 1920s. So it seems like such an energy, an era of joy and creativity and energy, and maybe Berlin and Paris and the United States. If I could speak the language, I think Berlin in the 1920s would be just so interesting. Um, so that would be number one. The more imaginative answer, and it's not terribly imaginative, uh, imaginative would be uh, to visit Rome in the time of you know, Caesar, if, if I'd make it out alive. To see, what was that like? How, were, how like us were those people? More than we think? Less than we think? What, what would an hour in conversation with someone then be like? Would it be unrecognizable or would it be eerily the same? And if there's anyone you could, like any particular person you could meet and ask a question to, you know, for example, you spoke about Jeremy Benson. Is there someone you'd like to meet from the past? And what would you ask them? Well, I think the, the one I'd most like to meet is Mill. Uh, I, I, I think Mill was, he's my favorite of uh, philosophers. Uh, and he was an economist too. I'd, I'd actually want to listen to him about Harriet Taylor. I think that was one of the great romances and it, I, that it inspired some of his um, you know, best ideas like ex experiments in living. And just to, I think it was a very deep love affair and to have him talk about her. I wouldn't learn anything about maybe about philosophy but learn something about life then and now. That does sound, does sound really ideal. Um, so we're approaching the end of the interview, but to conclude, we have one last question that comes from our audience. So um, the question was raised by Alex. So thank you, Alex, for submitting a question. And he would like to know, is there anywhere a nudge theory has been used where you did not expect to see it? A great question. I can see why you picked it. Um, I, I, the question's nicely ambiguous where, where where could be in some physical place or it could mean some substantive area. Uh, the physical place is Qatar, not because Qatar as a place surprises me so much with its use, but in connection with the World Cup. So I couldn't have anticipated that Qatar's effort to promote uh, uh, physical fitness and health in connection with the World Cup, that, that our little book that we worked on so hard in Chicago, that it would export itself to that context. And I've actually been to Qatar and talked to people about, you know, uh, fitness and health in connection with the World Cup. And if I'd been told in 2007 that that's where I would head 10 or so years after the book was published, I would have said, uh, you have quite an imagination. So that, that's what surprised me most, I guess, in terms of physical area. In terms of uh, uh, substantive areas, uh, uh, I couldn't have anticipated that our book would be applied to pandemics. Uh, that was, I can't speak for Dick Thaler, but that was not on the, the breadth of the ideas that was clear to us as we kept working on it. But pandemics, uh, uh, I'm not so much amazed to see it as 
unable to anticipate it. Couldn't possibly have put that on the list at the time. 